Today's guest is Hayley Lever from GM Moving and Chief Exec of Greater Sport. In her own words, Hayley says she has a simple plan. It is move every day, inspire and enable others to do the same. Smile, adventure, have fun. Be the change you want to see in the world, quoting Gandhi, of course. She says she's driven by a huge belief in the role of physical activity in sport and how it can play in our health, well-being and happiness. She says her work is a passion. How lucky am I, she says. Working to get Greater Manchester moving and helping as a volunteer to build a happier lives where she lives are two very rewarding roles. She loves to run, wild swim, cycle, play sport, adventure and travel, especially with her husband and three awesome girls. In her view, free time is best spent in the outdoors having fun with family and friends. Shopping centres, she says, are to be avoided. She prefers to spend her days making memories that last a lifetime. So I think you get the picture, but just as importantly, Hayley is one of the best thinkers and writers in the sector on the changes we need to make across the system to create movement that is embedded in society, as you will hear from our chat today. So Hayley, after that warm introduction from myself, the um, chance for you really to put the record straight and probably just to tell us a little bit about yourself before we kick off. But as you know, we're in a conversation, hopefully between us, we've known each other long enough to uh, keep that conversation going for some time but we're really looking forward to hearing from you so Hayley what, what how did you end up here um, in this space uh, in the support of sport and physical activity sector yeah so um yeah really great to, to have the opportunity for conversation um I how did I end up in this space <laughs> well first thing I would say is I don't really feel like I am in the sport and physical activity sector no. anymore yeah. um yeah. and probably haven't been Fully for the last six, seven years now. So that we'll get into that later because I yeah. know that will come up in response to some of the other questions. The, um, uh, however, the thing that has always driven me and still drives me now, um, if I think about my career journey to here, is is apart from a couple of little wrong turns, <laughs> I've always had <laughs> not wrong turns, interesting turns uh, where I've come back onto a path. Um, I've always had such a sort of like personal belief and commitment to the power yeah. of movement and physical yeah. activity and sport for me personally and for, and in my work and the and the couple of times that I've gone off to other um, on other paths and uh, and been dissatisfied or or um, mm. I've just not felt like I've really been working in my sweet spot. Our times, interestingly, I've reflected on that where I've veered a bit off course from yeah. from that agenda. So I've always um, loved to move. I have a long history of doing all kinds of things, you know, um, for, from a very young age, never being brilliant at anything, but always just loving sport yeah. and physical activity, a real jack of all trades. Um, and, and I wrote about this a while ago, but when, when I thought back over my relationship with moving and physical activity and sport, um, it had very much come from a place of people and friendship and community and... Yeah and um, positive, ex really, really positive experiences from a very young age, not from a sporty or outdoorsy no. family at all, um, but very much from school and from the community that I was living in, in Coventry, where um, it was just what we did to, to mm. socialise. There was loads mm. of great stuff and great people running yeah. clubs and activities in school, after school. As I was growing up, youth workers, you know, school teachers who, who were also youth workers, um, and people who pulled me into this sports club infrastructure and, yeah. and volunteering and things so so I came into this very much from a personal love of it's just what I did I didn't yeah. think about it um, because it was my social world really and then I discovered to enjoy the outdoors um, and then I guess I got pulled in Coventry did a lot of stuff um, around the time you know place you know I worked on play schemes because you made more <laughs> money in a play scheme than you did in a, in a pub or whatever um, and it was really fulfilling work so I got into you know uh, it was action sport days, you know, um, work experience, <laughs> volunteering, um, and then travelled and, came, you know, got into my first job after university um, was as one of the youth sport development officers um, in Warwickshire. 
and um, and from there my career is really from a very much sort of community sport development, youth sport development into um, broader sport development roles into my, a deviation into local government policy mm-hmm. uh, and then back on track going now actually I really really care about people moving and being active and tackling inequalities and activity and and then my career from then has really stayed on that path of how do we support a more active nation how do we tackle inequalities in, in an activity level so um yeah so and just you know I suppose and the reason I say I don't feel like I work in the sport and physical activity sector solely anymore is that when I'm, particularly when I moved to Greater Manchester in 2017 and the commitment and the belief there is there to a whole system approach to yeah. active lives. Yeah. My job when I moved to Greater Manchester was, you know, funded by health and, and by the combined authority in Sport England. And it really became like really designed in this is a whole system job I belong yeah. to. I'm part of a whole system. My role is to lead GM moving um, and essential to that is my role in leadership in the wider public service reform and health transformation space because those two things you know you you can't have one without the other you're not going to tackle inequalities in an activity without tackling wider social and structural inequalities and reform in public services so so from 2017 onwards i i've been in a system leadership role rather than a purely sport Mm. and physical activity sector role and i do think the language of that really matters in the context yeah. of what we're all trying to achieve yeah no that's a, a brilliant start um Hayley, from that perspective and just to say we'll, we'll do some links at the end but some of those blogs you've referred to are my inspiration as well for picking up some of your thinking and i suppose before we dive into that sort of system leadership st- stuff I, I wouldn't call it a deviation because as you know i spend as much time outside the so-called sport and physical activity sector as inside and it's really important to get that perspective on where it fits in a whole policy stuff. So your deviation probably is one of your strengths, isn't it? That you sat outside of that very narrow silo and seen policy from a wider perspective. So I suppose before we go to that system leadership stuff, it's, it's a little bit around the language. How, how often do you find, and I know we talked about this um, briefly before, but you know, making assumptions about people being on that journey, because you refer to quite a lot of programs that people who've been around a long time will recognize and they get rehashed and they come back but again so you've used it used the word moving uh, and other things so do you find that's quite important in those various with those various stakeholders that using different language sort of sets a different tone to those conversations um 100 percent and i am a bit of a stuck record on it and i (laughs) still feel i'm going against the grain in in some spaces yeah of the importance of that and my resistance to sport and physical activity sector language yeah. given what we're trying to influence and achieve yeah. um the you know because if what we if what we really need is a whole of government approach to yeah. active lives and inequalities if we keep talking about the sport sport and physical activity and using the language using that language in some spaces is is fine but mm. at the very least we should be talking about an inclusive sport and physical activity sector yeah. um in in those conversations and then in most of the spaces i'm in and most of my conversations i would use the language of movement yeah. and moving more and language is so important not just in a language is so important personally for people mm. we know that when we say the word sport or PE, it can have a really negative yeah. uh, first, you know, first sort of impression or a reaction from mm. a lot of people who are in the sort of 30% of mm. people who are least active and the furthest yeah. away from an active life. And, and the reality in, in, in the work that I'm doing is that if I'm spending most of my time in non-sport and physical activity sector spaces, so in health rooms and, health, um, and, and in you know, in our LGBTQ plus forums or our qualities panel rooms and things like that, um, the, the lot, lot of people who aren't living active lives are mm. um, have had very negative experiences of yeah. sport and PE, yeah. and um, so that so on a very personal level, it can be unhelpful. And we've we've found that the language of moving, and this is evidenced by the work we did with Britain Thinks back in 2018. We did a piece piece of research to help us understand about language and narrative in really engaging people yeah. Yeah. who are least active um, and it came through really really strongly there and that gave us permission and real 
instruction really to change the language that we used yeah um Precisely. so it, it matters to people personally and of course the thing is is that when people are in a meeting or in a room in a professional context they are a person <laughs> and so <laughs> most recent example of that is i was i was helping aqua to deliver on the nibev and nhs leadership program and the first thing I do in a lot of rooms is just get people talking to the person they're next to about how does moving matter to yeah. you and your work or your colleagues or your friends or your family, because that is the, a really accessible, easy way in to help people think about how moving matters. Moving matters to all of us. It matters. Mm. And yeah. so, so it's more accessible. It's more inclusive. It's, it opens up a whole different space, because if you've got, as I did have on that day, people sitting there who are leading the NHS in their part of the country, who have got massive challenges in their part of the system. Um, I haven't met anyone yet who can't who can't see how moving matters to them, either their own health and well-being or their staff's health and well-being or their patients or the people they're caring for at mm. home or in work. So it's just it's just a much wider lens and it's so much mm. more inclusive. And yes, there is a really important part that the sport and physical activity sector plays in in supporting an active nation, but we do need to be really careful about our language and the audience and, and the yeah. signals that that sends, you know, and the impact, the impact and implications of that. Yeah, I, 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 we totally agree um, on, on this. I think we share these views for quite a long time, but it is vitally important, and particularly those forums which we'll come on to in the system where it's just not even on people's radar. It's a, it's a non-starter, so I go to economic development meetings and they've got big, big issues that they're dealing with. The NHS, there is a bit of a linkage back to activity but it takes quite a lot to convince people in the economic development space around well-being in workplace i mean it, it is there but it's not for, first and foremost for a lot of people so that, I, I agree that language is important and everyone works in their silos i'm sure you then find that when you go into the nhs and they're all talking in their little sort of siloed language it's very difficult to to penetrate so, so that leads on to that next bit because this is where you've been very skillful in the stuff that you've done up in Manchester is, is really impressive, but this system change, you know, where do you start? I mean, there'll be lots of people across the country are listening to this who've probably got a, in their title and they've started making some sort of baby steps into doing some of this work. But looking back and reflecting, Hayley, on sort of where you started this, and I know you cover a lot of this, your blog, so we're just shortcutting a lot, but those early mistakes that you made in going to some of those first sort of meetings of just trying to probably sell sport and physical activity rather than understand the system i, I don't know i think i picked yeah, that up yeah, from yeah. your early pieces well it's interesting actually made because leading on that nye bevan leadership program the other week made me realize how far i'd come because i've seen yeah. the room for two days in leeds and i understood all the words they said <laughs> <laughs> That's a and I remember, forward. Yeah. yeah in my first um you know and for a long time in the nhs rooms that i was in in 2017-18 i was constantly putting my hands up going sorry what's that acronym what's that mean you know because we do all have our own language don't yeah. we in the different yeah. sectors we're in yeah. and and the health system is is yeah really complex language but yeah i've learned a lot i think the that point you make about not going into rooms to sell my thing to yes. people is key yeah. because that and also i think just in terms of our leadership Allowing ourselves to go into rooms and ask questions mm -hmm. rather than give present, you know, because quite often you get 10 minutes on an agenda if you look at, you know, mm -hmm. um, one one that really stands out in my mind was a meeting of the GP advisory group in, in GM and they meet in the evenings. These are all GPs and mm -hmm. primary care leaders who have been in a, you know, been, you know, flat out all day and they uh, had a meeting in the evening and we had 10 minutes on the agenda and it was like the first hour and a half of the meeting was looking at the new GP contract. <laughs> with with solicitors and things and we were listening to all of this and then i was thinking what am i going to do and of course we had a presentation prepared and we were ready to sell them you know the, yeah. the, the importance of physical activity to their work and i'm messaging the person sitting next to me from my team going ah, ah, this we've got to do this differently <laughs> and so um so what we actually did was i said you know what let's put all those lies to one side given what we've just heard and what you've just been talking about just get up and walk around the room, talk to the person next to you, talk about how does moving matter to you and your workforce and your teams. And it was the most brilliant conversation because yeah. um, asking them how much moving mattered to them and their yes. work, yeah. and there's no shortage of belief. What, what, what we were reminded of that evening was there's no shortage of belief in the health system. People understand that moving matters. Yeah. They, 
the challenges are massive and so our task is then to work out how um how does how what support can we give to mm. enable them to design moving into to their world and how how is what how is what's the kind of connect point of connection mm. between their biggest challenges and and our mm. offer if you like if you yeah. want to call it an offer and I, and by offer i don't mean a program or an initiative i mean yes. the power of movement so if the biggest challenge they've got is staff absence um you know challenges around um well-being mental health stress yeah. in the workforce then that's where we need to start so yeah. so meeting people like where they're at understanding their world and understanding how there's what is the pragmatic support that is not necessarily going to cost anything or not add to an overburdened mm. you know workload but yeah. what's the relationship that we can have that enables yeah. us to kind of work together on the thing that matters to us both yeah. So that kind of intersection between what matters to me and what matters to them. And so going into rooms and asking questions and being curious um, and starting from a place of seeking to understand rather than seeking to go into a room and sell or look to be commissioned to deliver yeah. something or look to get money or, yeah. you know, the, one of the other things that stands out, we had a room full of mental health service leads a few years ago, and uh, I, I just literally said to them, you know, if, if, if the table is zero and up here is ten, mm. to what extent do you believe that moving more, people moving more is part of the solution to mental health issues and challenges yeah. that people have? Yeah. And they're all up here, they're like eight, nine, yeah. ten. And yeah. then I asked him, and just to, as a visual representation, to what extent do you believe that people moving more is actually designed into the to the work you're doing and the support yeah. that you give people and the services the way it's designed into services and it was like three yeah so then yeah. the question just becomes well what would help to just shift it up a, you know what kind of support what kind of work could we do that would just shift that and take that with one small mm. step because otherwise it's just overwhelming for people mm. and they're just like Phew. you know yeah. they don't want time for this yeah. So yeah. yeah. So I think you know. In summary, I think it's from from a point of seek to understand the world of the people you're trying to connect with. Really, uh, you know, give yourself permission to be curious and ask questions rather than you know going into sell and to mm. give a presentation and to you know uh, and and that you know, there's whole ways that the world of work operates that 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 gets that makes that quite a courageous thing to do. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. meetings don't work like that, do they? In formal government <laughs> structures. So yeah, there's no. a whole other load of learning about how you some of the courage to ask a question in a room instead of just yeah. deliver yeah. a presentation. Yeah, exactly. So actually, there's another whole podcast off the back of that, isn't there? Just sort of what that looks like in terms of are meetings the best place for these things to happen? You know, if you're looking at system change, mm. you know, there's all sorts of stuff about meetings, but it really leads. Yeah. led anybody think we've planned this lately but it lead very nicely into that worldview piece that you've written recently which i thought was really interesting because increasingly there's a lot of us who are feeling well, i think you described it as you know pushing water uphill is this whole piece is very complicated and complex and i think sometimes people don't even get the baseline as you sort of suggested some some do get it but some of our language has masked what it is we're trying to achieve so i suppose that just reflecting on that blog, um, Ailey, do you think do you think we've pushed the water quite away up that hill? I know it's always sort of constantly coming back down at us as well. But do you think we, the, the the work that you've done, which has taken a very different approach, has demonstrated we can push that water up the hill, where a lot of others, you know, we probably haven't made that progress in the last twenty to thirty years. If I'm being really honest, at embedding all of this in the system. Yeah, I guess. Um... So the blogs, there's, there's so much in that the book, the patterning instinct that yeah. we could have pursued as a line of inquiry. But the when we kind of sat down, Scott and I, to kind of think about what's the one thing that this all of this reading and thinking about this uh, book could help us with now. Yeah. Um, it was a thing around. So, so we a few years ago, Scott and I'd read this book, and then we'd written a piece around culture change, and then we had created a culture layer around the socio-ecological model that was, I don't yeah. know if we were allowed to do that, but we did, and it's kind of become <laughs> designed, I don't know. That's how yeah. it's worked, it's just they're meant to be model, don't they? Some sort of plagiarism thing going on, but, yeah. uh, you know, with, so the, the socio-ecological model being about how, you know, about um, how how you can change policy and the physical environment, organisations, individuals, etc., to make change happen in any in any kind of uh, aspect of, of social change. What was the step over moment in the thinking back then was 
that the book kind of highlighted and was around it, it's entirely within our grasp and gift to change culture and if we're not really thinking about the role that culture plays a so language ideology our hierarchy of values you know mindsets mm. is massively influential in in the way the world is designed and organized and the way that decisions are made and where investment goes and stuff so so Three or four years ago, we were like, actually, let's let's you let's add this culture layer to that model, and we use that model. Um, it's embedded in our strategy. We use it all the time in the Greater Manchester system. It's a real, it's a real practical tool to unpick what are all the things that we, what are all the influences on active lives and inequalities, and which ones can we push at? You know, which what yeah. are the things that were in our sphere of control or influence to change? Yeah. And we'd spent, you know collectively a lot of time trying to trying to change organizations and and yeah. trying to change you know working on and we still do work on how yeah. to change the physical environment how to change um policy etc the 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 step over this time has been because because thinking about culture has become bread and butter to us now in, mm. in gm moving it's like yeah. it's we think about the role of culture all the time in in the work the thing that that this the reason we read it again is it became available on audible on audiobook and then listening to it over the last few months kind of brought some new things to the surface and it and it can be quite hard to navigate this but just so i guess the some people are never going to read the book a lot of people are never going to read the blog the the question of so that, so again it becomes down to what's the very practical tangible yeah. way that we can help people with with a tool and a model and a way of thinking and a set of questions that might just help um, to let things flow more easily. And, and the kind of breakthrough for me this time in reading it was like, um, imagine if <laughs> by changing the way we think and the, and the collective and dominant worldview that sits sort of underneath everything that happens, imagine if we could change that, right? <laughs> so imagine if the whole ideology that underpins what we've been doing for the last 30 years, if we were able to shift that by changing the conversations we had and the way that we, you know, the way that we collectively come into this work, then it might not cost anything and it might mm. not, you know what I mean? It might not cost anything. Yeah, no, no. It would be yeah. effortless yes. because we've seen, and, and the reason I have hope for this is because we've seen how changing language changes the way we think, feel yeah. and behave. And yeah. changing language doesn't cost anything. Changing yeah. from talking about sports to talking about moving hasn't doesn't cost us anything. It's a mental shift. Yeah. And then a whole load of stuff flows from it. And the Active Souls thing is a really good example of that. We didn't spend we haven't spent a penny on the Active Souls movement. <laughs> now all around the country people are wearing trainers to work. Our and hashtag. <laughs> the, the only thing we changed was the way we talk about movement yeah. and the clothes, you know, and permission sense of permission. And, yeah. The hierarchy of values that enable people to prioritize moving in the workplace and therefore permission to wear trainers to work and it's yeah. created a real ripple effect and we haven't spent a penny no on it. um so the so the the thing that this the, the blog is kind of exploring and, and as i sit here today i haven't got the answers to how we do this <laughs> but the hope i have is if you think about um the opportunity for something akin to the kind of future generations act or yes. you know the sort of some of the countries around the world where they're putting a whole different kind of ideology yeah. behind the approach such that you could actually take a real long-term view to policy making and investment decisions and um and being really explicit about the fact that this is about the future the health of future generations and planet that helps you to move beyond this kind of real either or thing about is it is it short term investment long term gain you know yeah. all of the struggles we have around um, decision making if every decision we made was run through the lens of a future generations act imagine what kind of world that could create so that's yeah. just what i find fascinating so i guess you know in small ways and big ways um, a lot of people use theories of change don't they as a kind of uh, process yeah. by which yeah. to decide what to do. Well, imagine if you put some questions at the front end of a theory of change conversation that went along the lines of what kind of ideology, what kind of collective worldview are we holding here before we start this whole process? Because yeah. that would then change the way we think about the question 
and the decisions we make and the investments we make and where we decide to put our efforts. You know, so what I'm playing around with uh, with this with this blog is um, the idea that instead of like spending the last 30 years as we are pushing water uphill, trying to put sport and physical activity on everyone's agenda, imagine if it was water flowing and all we needed to do was just move some rocks around at the top of the river around the language and the ideology and the way, and then water would flow more easily. And imagine if it was kind of effortless. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't such a struggle. And, we, and, the, and the hope in that is we've got some really good examples of where that's happening or has happened. So I know it's possible. I'm good. As you know, one of the reasons I love these conversations is because I agree with so much of what you're saying. So it just makes it easy to just say yes, 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 all the way through that contribution. And we're exactly in that sort of space at the moment, aren't we? I mean, there is not going to be any new muddies for the foreseeable future in terms of national policy filtering its way down. Um, you know, and it can be, I mean, obviously we look at individual policies that can sort of tinker and play around with stuff. But we, particularly the think tank, have moved into that space where it's actually what you need is this whole new narrative, as you say, some of the language you've used there. It's approaching these sort of things like the future generations act what they're doing in new zealand so if you take this well-being approach to the entire economy not just this silo approach to some sort of parts of it it does fundamentally shift doesn't it and i'm sure you do it as well but i may quite often use those um, slides of pictures of amsterdam in the 70s when it looked like every other capital city we now believe it was this wonderful cycle city but it, we wasn't there was a an ideological shift at a national level that said actually this needs to be different there's a different approach to to this and every now and then you get those little moments don't you where that, that that happens and i do feel at the moment there is an opportunity to talk about some of these things um you know you have to look at the happiness indexes and all those aren't you what all those countries are happy well they've let people move and have a relationship and have an environment where they can connect and loneliness is reduced so our role in all of that is to obviously put some policies in place and some programs but i think more fundamentally it is just to shift that direction of the nation as a whole and a conversation um, but you just went on very cleverly then, say, with some examples of that. So I think that's quite often we can have these esoteric discussions, can't we? But people say, yeah, yeah, but what does that mean? And I guess my next meeting or I go back to work on Monday, what, what, what could I do to, to help that or make a small move if I'm not going to change the national conversation? So you've had some successes. Mm -hmm. um, Hayley, that's why you're here, really, because you've done both the thinking and you're pushing some of that stone, to, so that water's still up there. Up the hill. So, so what's worked in in the in that space with this approach? It's good. Yeah, I mean, I think the what what feels helpful is in all sorts of ways. Loads and loads of examples come to mind. But I suppose the the first thing is giving ourselves permission to ask a different set of questions. Yeah. So whether that's in an organisation or a team or in a big room or, you know, the, there's so much about how we've designed our thinking spaces that is counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve. So you can mm. take any example of, um, you know, for, most recent example, right, so the report into cricket and racism yeah. in cricket and things. The, there is... There's a reaction, isn't there, to go, well, what do we need to, what do, we need to do? You know, what, what does anybody, what does an organisation like mine, what's our contribution to helping, you know, to change things? And we can, and there's going to be, um, you know, we've got these welfare officer roles that are being created, you know, as part of the um, response, which is brilliant. So we're going to have some capacity, there's a dedicated capacity and resource to, to play a leadership role around welfare in sport and sport, community sport and, you know, across Great Manchester to... Um, to shift, you mm. know, and to be, you know, to create more positive, inclusive, welcoming mm. environments, um, and address some of the toxic behaviours that's yeah. going on. So, yeah. so there's a real live example just in this moment, right? So, as a leader of an organisation, I can in that moment go right. So, there's going to be some investment. We're going to host some roles. We can get on with that. We can start mm. to recruit roles and write job descriptions, mm. or we can pause <laughs> and stop and think about what is the potential here what is the kind of if anything were possible what's the um opportunity we have to support change through the creation of this very you know dedicated specific resource capacity etc um so the conversation we're having as a team next week is as a whole team if there's going to be some resource and focus on this mm. what is the 
what is our all about? What's the ideology that sits behind that from an organisational perspective? What's the mindsets that we're coming into this with? What? Let's take some time to understand what this really is about and the the worldview that we're all holding mm. with, with regard to our role and contribution to this. And then, how do we... Um, change the conversation, ask ourselves a different set of questions that enables yeah. us to go, well, this is about something very specific, but there's a wider uh, opportunity to change sport, you know, in Greater Manchester yeah. and society. And we've got a good example, for example, at the moment, where because sometimes you get very just dedicated um, bit of programme investment. So we've got some yeah. investment at the moment from the um, Home Office uh, around, um, we're running a piece of work called Right to the Streets in Trafford. Yeah. Um, a couple of colleagues in the team have been leading on. And it's a one-year, you know, things that we would argue against, one-year investment in yeah. a programme and a, you know, that you had to bid for and all the rest of it. And yeah. actually what I'm love, absolutely loving seeing is how, if you ask yourself a different set of questions, give yourself permission to, to work differently with a short-term, one-year piece of funding, and you actually seek to set out to change culture mm. and the conversation through it um, and we've got a whole podcast series on right to the streets if you want to kind of like explore that but what's happening is although it's one piece of work in Trafford the ripple effect is bigger yeah. because the way that it's being done is different and the way that it's being shared is different and the way that the learning from it will go on to influence everything we do and we've had some brilliant stuff within the team and within the wider system in GM where we're all that where that one piece of investment is helping us all to think differently about you know, public spaces and about people's yeah. experience of public spaces. So the culture yeah. change, that potential that comes out of that is huge. So there's one example of, you know, I think the, the common thing, it doesn't matter whether it's about creating active schools or whether mm. it's about, you yeah. know, women and girls' experience in public spaces or whether it's about the shoes you wear to work or whether it's about what the NHS needs to do to kind of design moving in and support workforce wellbeing. The common thing is you have to create space and spaces for conversations that are different yeah. and that are asking different set of questions and yeah. then everything kind of flows from that and and yeah. it's a real joy to see it happening in in action and in practice and if i think about the work that's going on um, both in great manchester and around the country now it's so much more nuanced and kind of thoughtful mm. <laughs> you know really yeah, yeah. It's. It, it, I'm really optimistic about. But how about have you that. done those, Haley? Because obviously you, you're right. I mean, I've, I've been in some of those where there is an energy and a willingness. You know, people around the table have not just come to defend their corner or to promote their corner. So you know, creating that space for that to happen. But I just, I just wonder: is there a maturity now emerging of under that understanding that you can't just go? You know, we just can't go around saying everyone needs to be active and here's a here's a place to do it. You know, I, I think. Mm -hmm. From my perspective and increasing the work we're doing right going back to what you said right at the beginning it's about creating a culture and an environment where moving is natural rather than something you know we have to build in a go to a box called a gym or go to a sports club to do stuff it's about all the pieces that you do around where does that moving happen in your daily life and i suppose that's quite hard because people come with products you must get it all the time <laughs> i'm sure i push some people in your direction yeah. they always come to me we get loads of people who've got the answer uh, to all of these people not moving and it's an app or it's a particular program or whatever people trying to get this sort of system mm. approach to it is very difficult isn't it to get individuals who've got some great ideas to think at a systems level as well uh, are there enough around are there enough people to to do that yeah. are we making an impression outside of uh, or inside our sector as well as outside? I think it's changed a lot. I think yeah. the, um, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because yeah. there's a lot of passion, you know, there's a lot of passionate people yeah. with ideas yeah. and, you know, yeah. and the, there are many, 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 many solutions needed. I think yes. that's the thing is that yeah. is there isn't one silver bullet. We know that, no. but we also know that human humans are different and want different things and need different things to you know yeah. their life cycle etc and that yeah. projects and you know going back to where i started if i think yeah. about all the things I, I think we totted up you know like a list of 50 
think sports I'd ever tried or played or whatever through my childhood. Now, there were programmes and initiatives and investments mm. and decisions that, that created the conditions for that. But for me, as somebody growing up in Coventry, like I didn't care or know whose project or programme it was, mm. it, but it created this, the conditions for me to, yeah. to play out in the streets and to go yeah. to activities. And, and some of the things that have happened over time have, have, have closed some of those things mm. down, you know. So mm. some of this is about going back to some of the infrastructure and some of the design and some of the, that we used to have you know in the yeah. 70s and 80s kind of thing but yeah. the the way i i suppose the way i navigate that whole sort of the marketplace thing i guess is i just try to i just try to create spaces for people to connect with each mm. other so i yeah. try not to be a gatekeeper or a door opener a gate opener because that, I think what that's what's changed is from five, six years ago. My inbox would be full of people trying to sell me something yeah. or try and get me to yeah. sell something on their behalf to the system in Greater Manchester. Yeah, and the culture exactly has the really problem. shifted yeah. around that. Um, and I think one of the things that helps that culture shift is is making that challenge and tension really explicit and talking about yeah. it and recognising how systems have created the conditions in which people have needed to compete and transact with each mm. other in the marketplace and mm. and naming that is really important and then trying to create the spaces in which people because there are people with needs and there are people with offers and it is about how do they connect yeah. but but not seeing me as the all-powerful person who's gonna make that you know be the gatekeeper yeah. or closer to yeah. that so yeah so i just make that challenge really explicit and i and i won't play that role you know i just try and create spaces in which people can get and connect and yeah. build relationships i suppose and um you know i think the if i think about on a grand scale like what we need is a whole of government approach to health, don't we, and well-being, and yeah. you know some of the things you talked about in terms of those metrics and things. So, this is a this is a whole national kind of approach that we need. Um, and my my role, as I see it, is to high, help try and influence in all the spaces. You know, mm. that all of the things that are going to influence whether people whether we tackle mm. inactivity and inequalities in Greater Manchester, and there are some things that are directly within our sphere of control or influence and there's some things that feel like they're outside of that sphere of influence at times and one of the things that i think we've got better at naming this over the last few years um it's not been easy but the there are some structural and societal yeah. Yeah. underpinnings of all of this that we could we could push all the water uphill forever and a day but unless we really address economic inequalities mm. and wider you know, societal and structural inequalities, yeah. we are, you know, we are pushing water uphill because yeah. as we're, I don't know, you could all use all the metaphors you want, but we're trying to picture, picture filling, up the, filling up the tank and it's just it pouring, horrible. you know. Yeah. And COVID's <laughs> the best example of that, isn't yeah. it? Because you can yeah. create all the best conditions in the world for yeah. sport and active lives and then a pandemic hits and your graph falls off a cliff, yeah. you know, in yeah. terms of active lives. So... There's a there's a real question I think, um, and we're getting better at this I think across active partnership network and, and and all the spaces that we're in is is at least naming some of the things that are getting Precisely. in the way, yeah. even if they feel like they're outside of our control. Yeah, I think you're right. They're outside of our control in immediately, but they are fundamental. You know, those health inequalities and those others. I mean, it's, it's housing mm. policy. You know, somebody living in a damp, cold house with a, a not a poor job, poorly paid. Okay, they might be a bit better off being physically active, but it's probably highly unlikely that you know that their lifestyle allows that in the same way as anybody else would. Yeah. Um, you know, just paying for some kind of physical activity is probably beyond quite a lot of people. So you know, you just got to understand the bigger society problems that create the inequality, and just yeah, providing a bit of physical activity is not going to address all of those other social issues that and poverty yeah. issues that people are. Are facing so yeah you do we do have to yeah. call it out because it can feel like you're a bit of a sticking plaster otherwise doesn't it is that um, yeah and also yeah, poor, everyone's yeah. really poor around here pretty poor housing we'll come and run a, a football program over the summer and you'll all be happy um yeah, it, yeah. It's not, it doesn't work like that does it no and the other thing that just reminded me of and this was a bit of a realization um that what we measure and what we you know again it goes back to sort of value so when again growing up and you know my dad was a lorry driver my brother's an electrician mm. and and who you know i remember conversations we would have about active lives and physical activity and whatever 
they were both very, very active in their day jobs. And yet that doesn't count as far no. as we're concerned. You yeah. know, so they would say to me, well, you go off and do your running and your sport. And we're exhausted because we've been working, yeah. you know, manual yeah. work, labouring. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing that I think Canada have done some really good stuff on this is just recognising actually yeah. what counts when it comes to not sport and physical activity, no. but, but movement, you know, yes. and, and yeah. strength and, and yeah. all the things that matter to a healthy, you know, active life. Yeah. Um, it's just no, yeah, really interesting. It is interesting because I, I just go on a bit of a side, but, you know, I, I quite like monitoring my physical activity and levels, as you know, with various sort of bits of metrics, <laughs> gotcha. my zones and blah, blah, blah. And actually, um, you know, I have been more active and do more more movements of an afternoon gardening than I have playing full back for my club. You know, yeah. sort of, I, I've measured it. I can prove it's much more. Right, but we don't measure it. But it's for me, that's where the use of the language movement is important is actually it does need mm. to be built back into our daily lives and so that's why it is a big policy issue isn't it is that we it design is because some of the society most, the, yeah yeah because some of the, the the jobs that people do that are you know if you think about it from a class perspective and from a you know yeah. sort of it's all very well isn't it for middle class people to judge and shame people who have got you know manual jobs around their yeah physical activity levels and actually um, yeah. You know that that again, it comes back to the mindsets and thing of like really understanding what is it that we're aiming for here. And I think you know, yeah. bringing this right back to the sport and physical activity sector, the uh, what I'm not saying that the sport and physical activity sector hasn't got a really important part mm. to play mm. in developing yeah. an inclusive, you know, welcoming sporting structure, you know, structured yeah. environment, and that you know, PE and all the historical things that I've worked on my whole career are still absolutely vital. Like, I'm not suggesting that they're not an important no. part of the whole picture. Um, so when I talk about a whole system approach and a whole of government approach and a whole, you know, that sport and physical activity sector yeah. and infrastructure is yeah. like absolutely fundamental yeah. to how a lot of people get their minutes, if you know what I mean. So I, I wouldn't want anyone to go away and thinking that's, that I'm saying that's not important because it really is. It needs to be more inclusive. It needs to be a positive environment for people. Of all, you know, and all the work that's going on in that space, there's some brilliant stuff going on. Hmm. It's just that we need to just have that wider lens if we, when we're thinking about health, you know, and the well-being yeah. of future generations. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We find ourselves in a similar position. It's not being pretty. It, well, there is some criticism of the current sort of system because it's obviously. It got some of those issues that we know about. Mm. They're being exposed and they need to be tackled. But also just doing more of the same won't create new results. So exactly what you're saying, it's yes, we need to embed what we get because it looks after millions of people fairly well and uh, most of the time and there is a demand for it. But actually we've tried a few different things around the edges for a couple of decades and it's not really fundamentally changed. The mm. one third who are inactive and we know where they are, they're different groups and so we need to try something different. And I suppose it is that, isn't it? Is that I concentrate on the work on trying to tackle those inactive, who are inactive. And that requires a different approach, that whole system's approach. And outside, we never use the language, but the sector, you know, there are other people who are going to deliver some of that sort of stuff. Uh, mm. And it might just be, as you say, manual labour uh, is, 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 is part of that, isn't it? Is it the, mm. the level of movements you're doing. I just wonder, though, whether the sedentary lifestyles in the car and other bits are... Uh, whether that's crept so there's fewer and fewer manual jobs that provide that level of physical yeah. activity in, the, in their daily lives yeah definitely and the other bit we've not really touched on is the kind of importance of you know just healthy active places yeah. for people yeah. to move you know so the yeah you know in terms of as well an area of work that we're doing some really interesting stuff in now um is you know around that public public place making yeah. and healthy active places yeah. and active travel and yeah. all of, so that you know the they're all really important parts of the picture, aren't they? Um, the designing moving back into life um, yeah. currently feels like pushing water uphill because yeah, yeah. so much yeah. of the way society is designed and functions and operates yeah. is keeping us sitting still. Um, yes. And again, that yeah. we always this sort of um, balancing act. We do a lot of work with um, around sort of framing and public narrative and. There's always this dilemma, I think, about to what extent you paint the picture of the crisis and what, you know, to what extent you paint the picture of the optimistic, hopeful future that you're going to create. The reality is at the moment that there's a lot that's pushing against us in, in terms mm. of design and moving into life. And, um, and some of the things that 
hard to shift. So we've got some brilliant sort of evaluation coming through. You know, one of the things that we've been really searching for is a deeper understanding of what makes change happen in a systems approach. And we've got some great stuff really growing confidence in the learnings that's coming out of the evaluation work now across year moving which is really helping us to identify as well where the real barriers, where the common mm. barriers and sticking points are and the bits that are harder to push at. Mm. Um, and they are really entrenched things around like, yeah. you know, planning and policy making yeah. and governance and processes. And, and some of the, the thing that we've made least progress in, in terms of maturity so far is around governance and processes and, and then picking what that means uh, and the ways in which the world yeah. is, yeah, designed and governed yeah. and, and the way decisions get made around procurement, commissioning, finance, yeah. le- legal stuff, you know, there's, yeah. and those things are really common around across public service reform transformation as well. Mm. So they're not just, and that's why that wider work is so important because across Greater Manchester, there's a whole load of mission based things. You're know, working on homelessness, we're working on poverty action, we're working on um, inactivity, etc., And we're all hitting the same problems and blockages and barriers so we've got to be having a collective conversation about what they are and yeah. how how do we push at some of those things and redesign systems and processes Precisely. to unlock stuff um so that's another whole sort of um yeah, yeah. area yeah. of work yeah. really for us which is but, but you're right i mean we've designed it's taken 40 50 years well 50 60 years to design activity out of our lifestyle so it's not going to be an overnight Sort of win to get that back and we really need to be in those conversations don't we around the future of mobility you know, yeah. i sort of um, quite enjoy being in other spaces where that debate is taking place well i saw some research last week that the number of people using e-scooters haven't reduced car journeys that's just got people who we previously walked now jump on e-scooters you know there's unintended consequences sometimes that yeah, yeah. these yeah. things happening aren't they um so we just yeah. need to bear that in mind and then as you say planning and other bits are so long term and then the other bits, there are some, you know, there is a, an, an amendment to the, the Green Book that, that, around well-being. So there is well-being measures, that the Treasury's Green Book. But when I talk to civil servants, not many of them know about that and not many people in the wider sector do. So, you know, we, we, even though the, some of the tools mm. are there, we've now got to learn how to, to use those and embed them as a cultural approach to everything we do. Almost exactly what you said sort of earlier on. I suppose as we yeah. start to draw towards yeah. an end, um, Hayley, I suppose all you've done to me is, like I always do when I talk to you, it's just I'm overwhelmed by the possibilities, the challenges ahead, the things that you're doing. So I suppose there's two questions I always ask people is, how do you prioritise and what have you stopped doing? Because actually, it's a serious one, isn't it? I do lots of strategy work with people and they can all come up with a strategy that's got 26 priorities. Uh, so you, you can't do more than six. So which are you going to which are you going to stop? So how do you prioritise, and what have you stopped doing? That's the toughest. Personally, the well, there's layers. Up, yeah, no, no, oh, no, professionally, I've warmed you up now to. Yeah, get to the yeah. Well, it, there's layers to that for me because there's. Yeah. Um, I always knew there would be. <laughs> yeah. So, and what I mean by that is, if I think about the whole of the yeah. GM moving strategy, for example, and how how you prioritise there. So the the you know the kind of concept of rocks and um, pebbles and sands you know i don't do that mm. metaphor of like what are your absolute rocks um, and yeah. you know that's a, that we use that a lot both within the team and within the kind of wider system because one of the things i've learned in transitioning the active partnership you know from a what was largely a program delivery mm. organization yeah. funded to do a particular set of activities and resourced um, five, six years ago, uh, very, very different organisation now in terms of a, you know, a system influence and a leadership mm-hmm. support and connection role. And that, that journey to that um, has, has been bumpy, you know, let's face it, because people mm-hmm. have been learning a whole new way of working. I've had some real leadership challenges and how do you help people understand their role and contribution to this? Yeah. And, and then within that, how do you help people to to understand their role, to build capability and capacity, and then to prioritise, because it, it every door is open in Greater Manchester now. Like, I went from, you know, when you said, where did you start? I started with three people that I knew yeah. on 20, in 2017 in the Greater Manchester system. And now there's, like, a gazillion people that we know and all the doors are open and, you know, it, it, things are flowing, you know. So, But the, that brings challenges because you could fill your diary 20 times over. So... 
Yeah. So prioritisation is really important. I'm going to get to the answer in a minute. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's good to go back now. But... <laughs> So, so it's a massive challenge is the first thing because there's just yeah. so many possibilities and where you could spend your time. Exactly. So, you know, putting in place and having a team that are brilliant at putting in place really good systems and processes around planning, around business planning, around objective setting, around personal priorities and contribution is absolutely vital to this because we're a small organisation, Greater Sport and Active Partnership, you know, 38 people trying to work across the system. 2.8 million people living in Greater Manchester and, and most of whom work in Greater Manchester. We're trying to make moving everyone's business and we're 38 people. So we've got to, so a couple of things that have been really helpful, like uh, Warren, who's on our board and works in the health system in, in GM a few years ago, codified it really. And again, language is so important. It's how do we create the conditions in which we can have disproportionate influence across that whole of that system and the whole of the city region and so every the questions we're asking ourselves when we try and prioritize is what are we learning from the evidence base on the evaluation that helps us to understand whether what we're going to do is the most effective way of spending our time to create disproportionate level of influence across this system so if you just take the health and care integration work right we've got 150,000 people working in the NHS in Greater Manchester, never mind the wider ICP, which we're all part of, so VCSE, etc. So how you, with your small health team who come together, um, go, well, where you, where to put your effort? What are the ways of working? What's the evidence based on us about how to work? And then what are the priorities? And so there's, there's something about the what and the how of prioritising. So the one thing that we're all absolutely focused on is inactivity and inequalities and if it's not contributing to making progress on that then we're not doing it yeah we're very clear that we're not a delivery organization in the way that we used to be it's about system influencing leadership support and connection in a in a complex system mm. and then we absolutely have to be using the latest available evidence and creating an action learning environment to make sure that the way we do our work is is we're creating the conditions for the best possible impact with the very, very small resource that we are. Yeah. So, you know, again, I think it's there's no there's no silver bullet to prioritization, but there's a really good set of questions you can ask yourself. Yeah. And yeah. then what you stop doing is and the, and this was in this induction meeting with my new children and young people project officer yesterday, is the reason we don't send our staff into schools and deliver projects is we cannot do that at scale. You know, no. in a children and young people team that's got three, you know four or five people yeah. in it. Yeah. So we have to be quite brutal, mm. you know, about what we're not doing, mm. um, because we have to play our unique role in yeah. the system, you know, and not yeah. not not get too busy yeah. doing other people's work. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, because mission creep is just too easy, isn't it? And just being busy for busyness' sake. Well, saying yes to everything that to people do. ask you to do, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, because if you said yes to everything that people ask you to do or think you're there for, yeah. you'd be busy fools, for sure. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. And I'm glad you have stopped doing some stuff and have created some boundaries there, because it, it's vitally important given, you know, just the scale of what we've just been talking through for the last mm. sort of 50, 60 minutes. So just before we sort of sign off, there's always the bit at the end, isn't there, where I think, you know, triggered some thoughts or other thoughts that might might be another blog off the back of uh, this if there's, uh, <laughs> there's bits that you've covered but I think we've covered a lot of the stuff that you've done but is there anything else you know that's fresh in your mind at the moment you know learnings from the last sort of few weeks or so where is there anything in addition that you know would make a big difference to a young person like you said a young person turning up mm -hmm. we had this conversation didn't we yeah. how do you explain well, they're joining somewhere what's what's the future look like you sound quite optimistic which is hope which is good because I'm a half glass. I am optimistic. I am. Oh, I am. You know. Yeah. And I will. I'll come back to the last thing I did yeah. yesterday, which is always where <laughs> my head goes. Because I'm just thinking about the induction of this new, yeah. really yeah, junior absolutely. member of this team, right? So we've brought some. Because um, the, the reason I am hopeful and optimistic is because we don't need to repeat the failures of the last thirty years. No. You know. The, the, so anyone new coming into this. Um, yeah. If you create the conditions for a different kind of conversation and bring them on board, they don't they don't need to learn from all our mistakes. What what I just find joyful is with this person, we started the first thing I asked them was about their kind of their journey, what had brought them to here. 
And then there was a moment in which, um, you know, I asked about a decision that they took not to pursue a particular avenue. And, and then, anyway, it just opened up a whole load yeah. of conversation about yeah. it that was nothing to do with their job description or their role or what they're actually here for, but it was about get, asking questions that create space to get to know somebody and what matters to them. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the assumption that we have about a, a younger, junior, somebody coming into the beginning of their career... I think there's a, again, it's an ideology, a worldview thing that we assume that we're the experts, that we've got the answers and the mm. learning that they need. Yeah. And actually, that is that is not the case. Yes, we've got a lot of experience in standing in wrong turns, all the rest of it. But that assumption that those older, more experienced, higher up the food chain in the hierarchy mm. have got more value to today's challenges is is entirely yeah. wrong. Oh. Because just in this conversation yesterday, I was like blown away by the insight uh, and the possibility that comes from somebody who's joining the organisation new. And that just, you know, that's for me. Yeah. You've yeah. just got to keep asking questions and be curious and listen to people, Absolutely. especially young people. Yeah. Yeah, that's the unique, isn't it? If you can combine that sort of a little bit of experience but with the youthful insight and sort of pieces, and it's knowing when to step back and just allow that youthful exuberance to... To, to, to win through isn't it because actually they're far more insightful of their peer group but, you know um, we're getting old aren't we not not you but I'm, well, I'm getting older you know older 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 you know i think it is that and it's also it's not just exuberance i think the the, the thing that i'm struck by is that when we put people in a box so this is their role this is their yeah. title this is their job description if we don't allow ourselves to get to know people as human beings then we're mm. missing out on a whole load of value and contribution mm. that they might bring just because it's not yeah. in their job title and i've had a load yeah. of experiences of that recently around this blog actually because there's people on our team who have been curious about the blog and they're coming into the room going oh well i'm really interested in behavioral psychology or i'm really interested i'm yeah. i've got a master's in cultural anthropology that i didn't yeah. know about <laughs> all right get in the room right yeah, yeah, help yeah. us think about this it's yeah, not in their exactly. job title or mine but it no it's it's game changing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think it's just sort of more people have got that wider perspective. And um, yeah, putting people into job descriptions and holding them there is, is ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, it just doesn't Definitely. Work. <laughs> well, <laughs> Ailey, thanks ever so much again for being with us. Um, you know, there's just, there's just so many other sort of conversations that spark off of this. I know we've been trying to get this sorted for some time, but I think there's a there's definitely a follow up to some of these bits yeah. um, in a bit of a deeper one. But hopefully, it's useful to people. You know, hopefully, people have found it useful just to understand the leadership. I don't want to butt you up too much, but I mean, you have shown a leadership level at national level, not just in Manchester, because of the work that you've been able to do. And there are lots of people who follow your work for that reason, because you you know you've been on a journey and you're very open and honest about. It's not all a single line of success, really. is it? You know, that's like bumping oh, yeah. around, um, pushing that uh, water up the hill. And you've demonstrated that through persistence and a positive attitude, you can make this progress. So, you know, thank you for all you do uh, for encouraging large parts of the rest of the sector. You probably don't realise it half the time just from people who have like, read, read a blog and gone on and changed their own uh, options and opinions over something or approaching something differently. So, so keep up that good work. We'll try and share even more of, uh, of this. And we probably ought to do this on a regular basis just really to catch up with the progress that you're making. Um, we will come back to you um, next year, in particular, ahead of a general election. You know, we're looking for those big policy ideas that would make a difference as well as the sort of day to day combat. So I think that what you've reflected today is a large part of that, isn't it? You know, that sort of we need the big picture stuff, yeah. um, the ideological. We do. The, 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 but the I world suppose the final, thing, yeah. the final thing I would say is because I'm very conscious that. It can all feel just enormous and like mm. mind blowing. Yes. And the thing I'm absolutely clear about and know for sure is that you can make change happen with a conversation, and it yes. and it is actually really really simple. And yeah. and you can make even more change happen with a question. So yes. so I wouldn't want people to go away going, "Wow, that's blown my mind." <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to think about ideology and worldview. Yeah. Just you know, just even if you just take one thing away, uh, ask a yeah. question instead of yeah. going into a room to tell yeah. somebody something. Yeah. I can't add to that, can I? Worlds of wisdom <laughs> to, fin to finish. Absolutely perfect. You're absolutely right. Just, uh, yeah, ask the question and be hopeful that you can make the change. Thanks, Hayley. Thanks, Andy. Great to see you. Thanks for listening to the latest podcast. 
Hopefully you found it helpful and you've gained some insights from our guest. If you have enjoyed it today, it would be really helpful to hit the like button and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. As always, feel free to pop over to any of our social media channels to comment or ask a question. Or sign up to our monthly newsletter at sportsthinktank.com. If you're interested in supporting our work at the Sports Think Tank, again, just head over to the website or drop me an email. Thanks, and see you again next time. Thank you.